we're in this series called Generations. Last week we started talking about what is the church's responsibility to reach the next generation. And so we're, we're talking about this, a vision for what's next. Now our vision here at Avalon Church is very clear and it's very simple. Bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, why is that important? Well, the fact is, as a church, we always want to be about bringing people. That is our calling. That is the main reason Jesus left us here, to spread the gospel, the good news, to make disciples. And so the bringing people is an incredibly important part of what we do. There are a lot of churches that because they don't fight for this, they start out with this vision, but there are a lot of churches that will turn inward. And so everything becomes about taking care of everybody already in the building. And it, that's kind of like a, a, a Coast Guard rescue team going out to rescue people that have been involved in a, in a giant boating accident. There are people that are about to drown. And their job is to rescue. And instead of going to rescue, they're like, we want to have a mental health discussion. And we want to sit around and make sure everybody's children are taken care of. And the fact is, there's certainly nothing wrong with that kind of thing. But when your job is to rescue, then you need to do the job. And that's what we fight for here at Avalon Church, bringing people wherever they are. That defines what kind of church we're going to be. We talk about embracing the mess. We're talking about having open arms. We talk about Avalon Church being the perfect place for imperfect people. That's the wherever they are part. And they don't have to look like us, smell like us, like the same music that we like. But we are to be about giving the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. Wherever they are is also about chronological age. So we want to reach the next generation. The fact is, and I shared this with you last week, over 80% of people that ever get saved do so before they turn 16 years of age. Therefore, as a church, if we're going to participate in the gospel and the good news and do what Jesus has called us to do, we've got to, fo we cannot ignore the students and the teenagers and the children. They are to be a part of that mission, that vision, wherever they are. Of course, the most important part is bringing them into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. This fact is that we have a church filled with people that are at different levels. And I love that because that's like a family. You know, in a family, you're going to have grandparents and you're going to have mom and dad and you're going to have the kids, you got some cousins, some of them are weird, you know. You, you look at them like, good night, I'm glad that's not my kid, you know. Uh, you got that weird uncle that everybody knows is weird. He doesn't know he's weird. And if you say, well, there's no one weird in my family, I got bad news. You're the weird one, all right? So they're all mocking you. But in a family, you've got different levels of maturity. Nobody, when you have a baby, you say, you know what? You're going to get a job. You're three weeks old. Let's get out there and start, stop being so lazy, and you start contributing to this family. Nobody does that. You know why? Because they're a baby. And in a family, there must be different levels of maturity. Grandparents have lived a long time. They've gained a lot of wisdom. And so the same for a church. There are people that are really mature in our church that love Jesus. They've loved Jesus for a long time. They've grown in their walk with the Lord. They are knocking it out of the park when it comes to that. And then there are those that have been saved, but they're kind of like teenagers. You know how a teenager can make everything about himself or herself? That, that's kind of their job, right? They just think everything is the end of the world. Well, there are some Christian teenagers, and I'm not talking about chronological age. I'm talking about people that are kind of, they're kind of mature, they're not quite there. They're getting there. Then you got the children and the babies. And as long as we are fulfilling our vision as a church, we are always going to have people like that. And here's the problem. When you have a church that has been established, our church uh, will be 19 years old next month. That's hard to believe, all right? And when you've been around for 19 years, there are people that are going to have been here for a long time, and it's really easy to get critical. Listen closely. It is really easy to get critical of those that are not where you are. And as a church, we must fight that. We must not see the church as a country club for the initiated, a country club for the privileged, but rather 
as a hospital for the sick, as a place to rescue people with the good news of Jesus. Amen. Do we receive that church? I just feel like clapping a little bit on that. The fact is, that's good news. That's exciting. Well, today, we're going to continue this series, and uh, we're talking about creating a hunger for God. Now, I'm going to answer three questions in this, and don't put this up on the screen. Just leave the, uh, the title up there. But there are three questions we're going to answer today. How do you create a hunger in your children or grandchildren? Number one, how, how does a church create a hunger for God? In other words, becoming an attractive place where people want to come to, where people like to invite their friends. Now, don't raise your hand, but I'm sure we've all been a part of a church or around people like this that they say, hey, invite people, and you don't want to invite people because you're like, man, it is so bad. The services are so bad. The music is so bad. I'm kind of embarrassed. So what is a church's responsibility? How do we create a hunger for God? And then number three, how do you create a hunger in your own life? Having that hunger for God is critical, listen, to your joy. To your joy. And, and, and so we're going to talk about how we do this. We're going to read four verses today. Normally I read one passage. We talk about that, then I'll use some supporting verses. Uh, but today we're going to read four different verses from four different locations of the Bible. And they seem like they're unrelated, but they are very related. And I'm going to show you how. Uh, begin with me in Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child on the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Key word there is train, train. We're going to talk about that word. Proverbs twenty two fifteen. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. I love how it's the old King James. I grew up reading the old King James. It says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Can I get an amen right there? Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Uh, look, sometimes they do things that are so silly, and it's because they're immature. So he says, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Now, how many of you grew up in a household where the rod of discipline was used? Raise your hand. I have to raise both hands because I got it a lot, all right? So you know what I'm talking about. I know that there are many today that don't believe in that. And look, that is a dangerous place, not just for your home, but for your child. They must be taught how to deal with life. Part of the problem we have in our culture today is because nobody's ever been told no about anything. I mean, everything in their life was completely tailored to, to them, and, and they did not develop the, the social muscles, if you will. They did not develop the uh, relational muscles, and it doesn't help that we have social media that consumes so many people's time. Uh, to the, and I'm not against social media, don't get me wrong, but the fact is, if we're not careful we will lose a generation without interacting with them in a way that's going to help them know Jesus. Very easy to do. Well, here's the next verse that you say, well, this is not related. I'll show you how it is. Uh, Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Now, the key word there is taste. So we've got train. Discipline and taste, very important words. And then the last one, the words of Jesus, Matthew 5, 6. This is from his message we call the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. The key word there is hunger. Did you notice the theme in these verses? Hunger, taste, creating something that's going to be an experience uh, for the child, for your life. You and I need to learn about hunger. And you say, well, if you'll dismiss, I'm hungry right now, and I'm going to get me some lunch. And I get that, okay? The fact is, I'm hungry as well. I get up really early in the mornings, and uh, sometimes I eat like just a little like shake or you know, protein shake or whatever. And so if I'm doing that at 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, by the time lunchtime gets here, I'm, I'm ravenous, all right? I get it. But here's the thing about hunger. When you're able to satisfy your hunger, it's one of the greatest things in the world. Would you agree with that? How many of you believe in Christian food like Chick-fil-A? 
Uh, I just, uh, you know, the gospel bird. You know what I'm talking about? Love Chick-fil-A. And I love the fact that, that, you know, the founders of that are Christian and all. But I'd love that even if it was an atheist uh, organization because it's just so good. Just so good. How many of you grew up like I did uh, that every week you went to your grandma's house? In, In our family, we would do this literally almost every Sunday we went to grandma's house. And after church, we would go to grandma's house, and we would have the most amazing, delicious food. My grandpa uh, would make hamburgers on the grill, and I love that. He had this sugar-cured country ham that he had a secret recipe to making, and I'm not exaggerating. It is some of the best things I've ever tasted in my life. I can't even describe to you how good it is or how good it was. Uh, like my uncle said, if you put a piece of it on your forehead, your tongue would beat your brains out trying to get to it. It was so good. And uh, I don't know about you, but in our family, when we'd have Christmas or Thanksgiving or Sunday dinner, man, they made enough food for about 15 families. Anybody know, know what I'm talking about? Okay, and you'd walk in there and you're hungry and you're like, you're smelling stuff and you're like, man, this is gonna be so good. And then you eat and then you go back and eat some more. And then you go back and eat some more. And then you go get dessert, all right? So, and my grandpa used to make this homemade ice cream. How many like homemade ice cream? I love homemade ice cream. And we would get ice cold watermelon. Oh, so, so good. And I just am jealous thinking about it, thinking that I don't get to do that this afternoon. The fact is, there's something about hunger. Let me, let me just kind of say, in my opinion... Why I believe, and this is a theological opinion, why I believe that God used the metaphor of hunger and taste to describe how we can see God, how we can experience this relationship with God, how we can uh, be a part of the family of God. Let me explain it to you. I believe it shows the relational aspect of God. Okay, God's not just this cosmic creature in the sky and he wants to dictate your life and he's going to have all these rules and every time you get out of line he's going to take pleasure in whacking you upside the head with his holy staff he is going to smite you because he is the almighty smiter right and look that's not the picture of God but God rather is a relational God he wants not only to know you but he wants you to know him Now, let's look at the senses. And some people say there are more than five senses. I don't know if there is or not. Uh, I know that I was taught there were five senses. You can see, you can hear, you can taste, you can smell, you can feel. And if you want to say, well, there are other senses, you know, like the sixth sense and all that stuff, that's fine. But I'm going to talk about five, all right, that I know of. Um, There are things about four of the five senses that you can simply ignore. Let me just give you an example. Uh, I see, right? I see, I can see. But have you ever just like been looking at something and not see what was actually there? Like you can see from peripheral vision or maybe you're focusing on this, but you don't see that, you know? So here's the thing about seeing. Wonderful, wonderful uh, sense. Thank God for it. But it can be ignored. I can see stuff like my wife will bag up trash if I don't, like do my job, I don't know why it's my job, but if I don't do my job of taking out the trash, she will bag it up and set it in the middle of the floor. And I am an expert at stepping around it, all right? So, I mean, you know, she's like, you know, why don't you take this out? I'm like, why don't you take it out, you know? So, but the fact is, just as an example, I see it, but I ignore it, right? I, the same thing with hearing. I can hear, but I'm good at hearing what I want to hear. How many husbands in the room? All right, amen, hallelujah, right? So, I mean, we can kind of hear selectively. I didn't remember you saying that. Oh, yeah, you were in the other room, and I was running the washing machine, and uh, there was all this noise, and I was still talking to you. Why don't you hear what I said, right? We can ignore stuff with hearing. Same with the smell. Um, You know, you kind of ignore it sometimes. It's a powerful thing. Touch, you ever have like your kid when they were little, you're in a conversation and you've taught them not to interrupt because that's rude 
And uh, I grew up with the understanding that children were not to be seen or heard if you're visiting company, you know. And, uh, but you ever like have the child just kind of tap you on the arm and you just ignore it because you're like, no, I'm talking. And they're just tap, 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 tap. So you can, you can ignore those things. But I submit to you that when it comes to taste, that is one sense that is incredibly difficult to ignore. But why? Because it is experiential. It is one of the senses, and there are many ways that other senses could do this, but it is, it is, I believe, the most powerful sense about bringing joy and experience into your life. I mean, look, how many people have you watched when they taste something that tastes really good? They're just like, oh, whoa, this is so, so, you got to taste this. And they don't do that a lot of times with seeing things or hearing things. I mean, some people do. But taste, there's something about it. You can't ignore it. If I get some good chocolate in my mouth, I'm having a good day. I don't care what's going on. That's like, mmm, boy, that tastes good. I mean, like blackberry cobbler with vanilla ice cream. Anybody like that? Oh, my goodness, I can taste that. And it could be the whole world could be falling apart, but you know what I've got? I got me a little bit of joy in a bowl right there in front of me. And here's what I believe. Taste is one of the things that expresses to you and others joy more than any other sense. When I taste something that just blows my mind, I'm just like, oh my goodness, you have got to taste this. And I believe what God tells us here is that he wants to be not only involved in our life, but he wants us to know him and for him to know us. But in addition to that, he wants us to know the joy of experiencing a relationship with God. Do you get that? You see, there's a difference between being a Christian and being a Christian that is filled with joy. There are a lot of miserable Christians. There are a lot of Christians that are angry and sad. And there are, there are times to be angry and sad. Don't get me wrong. But have you ever just met the person that's just a perpetual grouch? A perpetual negative person? Nothing's ever going to go right. Nothing's ever good going to happen. I mean, look, the fact is God has given us an opportunity to experience incredible joy. Now, joy is not happiness. Happiness is based on your circumstances. But joy is rooted in your relationship with God that in spite of your circumstances, you've got joy. Okay? Now, I, I want you to notice, like I said, taste and hunger. Taste and hunger. Um, in the days that this was written, the verse that we read, uh, let's put uh, Psalm I'm sorry, Proverbs 22.6, back up on the screen if we can. Proverbs 22.6, I want you to see this. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And this tells us a lot about how to raise our children, but I want you to concentrate on the word train. Train up a child. Train up a child. This word came from a practice that midwives or new mothers would do back thousands of years ago when this verse was written. And here's what they would do. They would take dates and mince them up. Oftentimes, this is kind of gross, I know. They would literally chew the dates up into a little paste. And they would take this paste and put it on their finger. And for a newborn baby, what they would do is they would take this date paste that had been minced and made just into a little tasty paste, and they would rub it on the gums and the roof of the mouth of the child. That was what was known as training a child. Now, what was that training that child for? That was training that child for the ability to suckle, the ability to taste, the ability to, to grow and to be healthy and to live. Literally, that baby's life depended upon whether or not it learned to suckle and feed. And what they would do is they would create a hunger a desire. There was a sweetness. And what that child needed desperately was to be able to feed and to grow. And it brought joy. 
Now I want you to take that and think about it for a minute. What God wants us to do is to create a hunger, to create a hunger. Now, I told you I was going to answer three questions. First of all, how do you create a hunger in your own children's lives? This is a very important thing, and we've got to learn how to do that. Our job is to create a hunger for good, and especially for the things of God. We're to train them to love God. Obviously, you can't eat for them, but you can create a hunger and a desire in a child. How do you do that? Uh, Well, we've got to train our children on a macro and a micro level. Macro level, train a child the way he should go, that means to follow Jesus, to be a believer, to love God. That's the big picture. But also take in consideration the personalities of all your children. We have three children, and they're all very, very different. They're all adults now. But when they were growing up, it was amazing to watch the difference in their little attitudes, uh, Brittany, our oldest, was the most patient and um, uh, pliant, if you will, uh, um, child that would just like do whatever you told her. You, you could speak to her. We rarely ever disciplined her because she just always did what we said. She was just this perfect little child, I thought. And um, then Brandon came along. And Brandon is completely the opposite. He was the most stubborn child the most determined child I've ever seen in my life. And it was a real challenge oftentimes dealing with him. And then our third child was born, Brooke, uh, the fire baby. This, this little girl, when she was little, she would get so angry that she would start to cry and she would get so angry that she would pass out. And of course, the first time that happened, Kim and I freaked out. We were calling 911. We didn't know what was wrong. The, the doctor was like, I just, she'll be okay. Uh, she just got mad and she passed out. <laughs> so all of our kids were so completely different with their personalities. But you've got to learn to train a child in the way he should go or she should go. And when you do that, you're taking into consideration their own needs. Now, there are two things that you've got to see that are key in the verses that we've read. The word train and the word discipline. In other words, we must develop and discipline our children. Now, what are the key elements? Let me just give you this uh, so you can understand. Parents, listen closely. There are three things you need to do. Number one, you got to have commitment. Commitment. If you're not committed to church, to your children's lives, their well-being, their spiritual well-being, then none of this is going to work. Number two, you got to have encouragement. you got to encourage your kids, not just like send them to church, but come with them encourage them. And then number three, you got to have engagement. You got to engage with them. And in other words, you serve alongside of them. You come and be a part of church alongside of them. What this does as they watch you, it begins to create a taste for God in their life. Now, we're not talking about force feeding kids. We're not talking about hypocrisy. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about creating a desire for God. So how does that apply? Well, you've got to commit your life and your family to God. It doesn't work if you don't. You've got to bring them to church. You've got to encourage them to participate and serve. Our philosophy for our uh, teenagers and, and children is the same for the adults. We want them to serve somewhere. We want them to be a part because by doing that, it helps them Be committed in their own uh, walk with the Lord. Talk positive about the church. You know, one thing that I learned from my parents um, is I would not talk negative in front of our children about anything going on in the church. Just wouldn't do it. There's a reason for that because a lot of times you can start talking about this and that and all these problems in the church and the kids, you know what they hear? Boy, this is a bad place. Boy, this is full of bad people. That's what they hear. And and so be careful about that. Talk positive. Uh, Participate with them. Have fun. It's amazing to me how many people think that you cannot have fun as a Christian. That is absolutely untrue. Have fun with them. Uh, Lead them during the week. You see, here's the thing. If you're faithful, if you're an every Sunday kind of person, 
Well, they're still going to miss a good number of Sundays because they're going to be sick sometimes. You're going to be on vacation sometimes and so forth. Uh, for those of you with blended families, sometimes you get your kids every other week and you have my kids, your kids, and our kids. And so it becomes even more of a challenge. And, and so for faithful people, I want you to get this, we're going to get somewhere between 25 and 45 Sundays a year. We're talking about faithful people, okay? Now, I want you to think about this. We'll get 45 hours in an entire year with your kid, and you have 24 hours a day with them. Who do you think has the greater influence? Who do you think has the more powerful example? Well, it's you. And so the church cannot be the primary thing. You are the primary teacher of the gospel to them. You are the primary person that shows them how to have a relationship with God. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. That's the beauty of it. You don't need to be, and God can use you, and you must participate with them at church and do this because uh, you're going to encourage them in the normal rhythms of life. And then finally, uh, be prepared for inevitable conflict. Can I say this? As your kids get older... There's going to be drama at church. As they enter middle school, high school, um, I don't know if you remember what that was like, but I could have a girlfriend at 10 o'clock and not have a girlfriend at 11 o'clock, all right? So, I mean, it was literally like that when you're growing up, you know? And, uh, hey, we are celebrating our anniversary today. Really, how long have we been together? Three days, <laughs> you know? And I'm just going to tell you, there's going to be inevitable conflict. They're going to get to the point where they don't like somebody in the children's ministry or student ministry. Oh, she didn't treat me fair. Oh, he said something that hurt my feelings. Be prepared for inevitable conflict. And listen, parents online watching, also here in the room, listen closely. Be the parent for God's sake. And I'm not trying to be unkind or harsh. But I'm saying somebody needs to be in charge of the home. It's either going to be you or them. And let me tell you, they're not prepared. They think they are. They think they know everything. But the fact is you need to be prepared for inevitable conflict. What, is I, what do I mean by that? Well, there are times that, you know, you may have to say to your kids, no, I'm sorry, we're going to church whether you like it or not. You know? I mean, look, let's be honest. Is there anybody in this room that 100% of the Sundays of your life, you woke up and like, woo we get to go to church today. I'm the pastor. And that doesn't even happen, okay? All right? There are times like, you know, I don't want to go. And Kim says, you've got to. You're the pastor. You, you got to speak today. Be prepared for inevitable conflict. And then... Um, let me just give you, they're starting to play for me, which they don't realize has zero impact on me. All right, so, because I'm going to finish this. All right, um, how does a church create hunger, create a hunger for God? Um, you got to have responsibility, flexibility, and availability. Let me explain that. By responsibility, we have a, a responsibility as a church to remain gospel-centered in our teaching and worship of kids. That's our responsibility. We can never drift away from that. Uh, we must, as a church, take that responsibility. Uh, we also need to have a commitment to staying on the cutting edge of ministry. In other words, we've got to be flexible. When we started this church 19 years ago, there were not many churches that used the kind of music that we use. We did that on purpose so we could reach people with the gospel. And we got to be available, or flexible rather, so that when things change, when time changes, times change, that we're ready, that we can be flexible as a church. That doesn't mean we change our message. That never changes. The gospel is always what we go with. But we, as a church, must be committed to staying on the cutting edge of what works. And then we've got to invest in the life of, lives of kids and teens. Uh, you need to serve in kids and student ministry. Serve somewhere so that you're part of growing the church, the body of Christ, and then give. Give to the vision. That way we are able to do ministry. 
That way we're able to save children's lives. We're able to put kids in heaven. And, and that is how a church stays committed to creating this hunger for God. Because here's the thing. If as a church we are irrelevant in our message and our methods, nobody's going to come. We must stay a place that creates a hunger for God. And once again, bells and whistles and programs, that's all wonderful and good. But we must stay committed to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And then finally, how does an individual create a hunger for God in their life? Um, he said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man. Um, it's through praise. You start by experiencing the goodness of God. You, you taste it. You experience it. You're paying attention to it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How can two people walk into the same situation and one be negative and angry and the other thankful and full of joy? Two people walk into the same situation. You walk in and maybe there's some toys scattered around the floor of the house. Maybe isn't quite as clean as you want it to be. Uh, you are watching, trying to watch something and there's all this noise from these kids in the room. You get angry at your wife and you have words with her because like, you know, why is this this way? And I don't like this and I'm upset with you. And at the end of the night, he's sulking, he's isolated and he's angry. On the other hand, same guy or same situation walks into his house and he sees the toys and rather than being upset saying man the house isn't clean he's going man thank God you know that I have a house to live in and there are people not just across the world but even in our community that don't have a place to lay their head thank you Jesus I've got a house to live in oh and by the way thank I know those kids left that out and I stepped on it in the middle of the night and I do everything I can to keep from cursing so that I don't wake them up. And uh, But Lord, thank you that I've got kids. Thank you for a roof over my head. And there's my lovely wife. Man, what a joy it is to be married. I know that she's not perfect, but I'm not perfect. Man, she puts up with a lot of junk for me, and I'm so thankful that I've got her in my life. Same situation. Both people tired. Both people aggravated. You know what the difference was? One was tasting the goodness of the Lord by being thankful and praising God. You want to create a hunger in your life? Learn to do that. Learn to praise God. Learn to be thankful. It says in Hebrews 6, 5, having tasted the goodness of the Word of God. Read the Bible. It will help you create a hunger for God. 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that you may grow up, by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Praise God. You want to create more of a desire for God in your life? Learn to start doing that. Then participate. He says, blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. You want to create more of a hunger for God? Participate more in the church. Be involved in a ministry, a small group. All these things. Why? Because it'll create a hunger for God in your life. I've seen it happen thousands and thousands of times. And then finally, pleasure. You know what Jesus said? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied they're going to be satisfied how how does that work you ever you ever just have something you experience something that's so good that you just kind of like go ah. now typically men and women sigh differently when a man sighs he's like ah oh, that tasted good or ah oh, this is a uh, quiet moment or ah, I'm watching football or whatever when a woman sighs it's normally because she's upset at her husband about something alright so 
But have you ever just had that moment that you're just like, the pleasure is like the joy, you're just like so thankful, and you're just like, the only thing is like, oh, oh, that's so good. That's what God wants for you. That kind of experience with Him when you come to church, when you read your Bible before you go to work, when you pray with your kids before they go to bed, you're able to lay your head on the pillow at night and go, God, I wasn't perfect today. I blew it a couple times. But I'm so thankful for your salvation and your mercy and your grace. And I just want you to know, I'm satisfied. Are you satisfied? God says when you hunger and thirst after him, you will be. Heavenly Father, help us to be satisfied in Jesus satisfied in you. And Lord, I pray for anyone online or in the room that needs Jesus today, that they would find their satisfaction in him. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.